Good afternoon, and thank you for joining NSBA for our call today on the Corporate Transparency Act. Um, we're hoping to have a, a lively discussion. Um, Todd McCracken, President and CEO of NSBA, will be giving a, uh, a nice background to everybody, and then we'd like to take your um, questions and answers. Uh, we do have all lines muted. We're expecting quite a few people on the call, so uh, if you have questions, feel free to put those. You can either raise your hand when it's time for the Q&A, or you can put those into the chat. Um, otherwise, if you can keep the chat relatively clear, that will certainly help us prioritize those questions. Um, I'm Molly Day here at NSBA. I'm the VP of Public Affairs. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Todd. Thank you very much, Molly, and thank you all for joining us today. It's been a few minutes with us uh, talking exclusively about the Corporate Transparency Act. I know we've mentioned this a few times in other, other meetings that we've had, uh, and some of you may have heard that, but I wanted to spend some time so that you can find out more and get your questions answered if you have any about, about, about the act itself and, and the actions that we've taken and why we've taken them and where we think it's going to go in the future. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, the Corporate Transparency Act was was passed uh, in uh, actually at the very end of the of the Trump administration. It's one of the last bills that he signed, which was passed in that Congress on a pretty strong bipartisan vote. Again, it was part of some much bigger things. So it wasn't just about the Corporate Transparency Act, um, but it was it, um, uh, it passed, and, and and we've been waiting for the regulations to uh, to to implement it. And they just came out a couple months ago. This act, though, we've been fighting for some years uh, because we think it is overly intrusive and creates a burden for the small business community that is, that is, that is just unacceptable. Uh, what it does is it requires uh, every entity, now I, I use that word advisedly because I don't just mean every business, but every entity. So, so a business might control three or four different entities that might have some, some that might have the real estate, some might have uh, other parts of the business. But anyway, every entity that has fewer than 20 employees and less than $5 million in annual revenue is required to report to the federal government, uh, a division of the Department of Treasury called FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. You have to report to them uh, when they start a business, uh, and if you're already in, a, in the business, you have to report to them uh, uh, by, by a deadline they have set forth um, on every single beneficial owner of the company. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the definition of beneficial owner is relatively vague and is not something that's found in the law anywhere else. I mean, no, and and the, 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 the small business owners can't rely on some other definition of ownership they may have established for some other purpose. This is a new thing. They're going to have to figure out uh, if there are multiple owners of the business, which ones are beneficial owners and which ones are not. Uh, once you've decided who is the beneficial owner, you're required to report detailed personal information about all of those individuals, their home address, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, passport numbers, et cetera, uh, and keep that information up to date. So if any of it changes uh, for any owner, even if it's not someone that you, you know, know well or might even know their personal circumstances, uh, you have to report that change within 60 days to the Department of Treasury. Um, and uh, the the penalties for not complying are significant. There are, there are very significant fines that can be levied. And for willful violations, there are prison terms, up to two years in prison, which which could be allotted. So there, it's, a, it's a very significant problem. And, we, and, and there's a distinct lack of awareness about all this in the small business community. Um, and so we're, we're deeply concerned. One of the biggest questions I always get is, well, why are they doing this? I mean, does this make any sense? What's the point? Um, and of course, what they will tell you is that it's to catch uh, money launderers. Um, and uh, uh, which, though, from our perspective, doesn't make a lot of sense because the vast majority of small companies are not involved in money laundering. So all this data that will be pouring in to FinCEN will have nothing to do with the criminals they're trying to catch. Moreover, there's no evidence that the criminals themselves are going to voluntarily report the information just because there's a new regulation on the books that says they have to. So we think it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, poor tool for catching money launderers. Uh, the, uh, the, a better tool, the one that we sort of already have to some degree in place, is 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 to think about what financial institutions can do. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, money laundering generally happens through various kinds of financial institutions. Uh, that's where the money is, um, and, uh, and so having them report as they are required to do already uh, on suspicious activities and to and to know who their customers are in some detail, which is already the case, and have them 
vet that information makes a great deal of sense. Uh, however, the impetus behind this fact we're now facing is the banks themselves. They were the primary uh, lobbyists to get this thing enacted a couple of years ago. Um, and, and the reason they did that is because they are trying to get out from under the reporting themselves. And so their next step in this is now that this is in place is they've already been lobbying to, uh, to, to get out from under the, the reporting requirements that they have. Um, so that's why this is happening. That's what's going on here. Um, and uh, so essentially, we have a whole new reporting regime under significant penalties only for the smallest of businesses. So it doesn't apply to anybody that has more than 20 employees or more than $5 million in revenue. So not only are financial institutions trying to get out from under this, the, the, the bigger companies are already out of it. Uh, so, so we're, we're profoundly concerned for all those reasons. Um, so we have, uh, uh, filed suit actually in federal court, uh, not for any of those reasons that I've just stated, but because we actually think the law itself is unconstitutional. Um, we, it's, uh, basically the, the constitution, uh, does not allow, uh, the federal government to go in and swoop up information for for criminal investigation purposes uh, without a uh, reasonable cause. Uh, so we think this is an illegal search and seizure, essentially. Uh, there is no suggestion in the, in the law that uh, the federal government needs this information for any reason other than criminal prosecutions. Of, of folks, so it clearly is it's not a, it's not a regulation of business. It's not a regulation of interstate commerce. Uh, it's a it's a law enforcement enterprise, um, and for that they should need some level of of uh, uh, court authorization, which this law uh, supersedes. Um, and, and there are a whole no slate of other reasons why we think this is this is uh, unconstitutional. Um, and I actually would invite you to we have a terrific website uh, that outlines. Uh, the Corporate Transparency Act, uh, why we're taking the action we're taking, uh, and where we have the complaint that that has been filed by the uh, by our attorneys uh, in federal court and actually in Alabama uh, on behalf of a member there and ourselves, that I think does a great job of of outlining the uh, the issues at hand uh, in a very understandable way. It does not uh, go deep into legalese. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a legal document that I, that I think any lay person can read and, and, and get through the issues on. Um, so uh, really, I just kind of want to lay this out. We expect uh, we file the brief the uh, complaint, I should, I should say, on November 15th. Uh, the, the federal government has 60 days to respond. Uh, it's the Department of Justice that always responds on behalf of any agency that is that's taken to court in this way. Um, so we expect their uh, um, a response will come early January, um, and and the suit will uh, proceed from there. I mean, we obviously are going to hope for a quick end, a summary judgment, and and at, and if not that, at least an injunction. All this works its way through through the courts. Um, I don't think it would is at all unlikely that this will land at the at the Supreme Court. Um, but if it takes itself it takes it that long, I should say. Uh, to get to that level, that probably will be after the date of, of implementation of these new regulations. Uh, so we certainly hope that some kind of an injunction is in order uh, to prevent um, the, the, the collection of all this unnecessary information from the small business community. Um, there are a whole bunch of other concerns and worries about this, but I really want to, um, I think we can get to those if we have the discussion. So I want to see if there are, if there are, uh, any questions I can answer for folks? Um, and if not, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and describe some other things up front. But Molly, how do we wanna have people uh, just have them raise their hands or do we wanna have them put questions in the chat? Um, we can do either way. So if you if you click on reactions and raise your hand, which uh, I see that Cheryl has done, um, mm -hmm. that's the quickest way to do it. Or you can just put your, your uh, question directly in the chat. So why don't we go first to Cheryl and Todd, you can answer her question. Hi, good morning to everyone. My name is Cheryl Walker. I'm the founder and CEO of Luxus Consulting Firm. So Todd, you know, um, talk to us a little bit more when you're talking about the financial institutions and we're talking about, you know, the money laundering and that type of thing. Are these the major banks? 
that they're targeting or they're mentioning are these some of your smaller banks like your credit unions and things of that nature. So we're talking about larger like Bank of America and you know on that level are we talking directly about the smaller uh, banks please. Thank well, you. when I mentioned the financial institutions, I mean, I mean right now, uh, all the banks are required to, to collect information about their customers to figure out you know, who is it exactly they're doing business with, who's opening accounts, um, so that they can identify those things. And they are already supposed to, if they see suspicious activity, uh, or there's something they're worried about, they're supposed to pass that along to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network right now. But those are the regulations that those institutions are trying to get out from under because this is now imposed on the small business community directly. Um, uh, whether they be successful or not, I don't know, but they knew they wouldn't be successful so long as there wasn't a, a, an accompanying requirement on small business to report. So that's why this has happened. Um, but uh, uh, so, so we're not advocating for any sort of an additional regulations on banks uh, as a result of this, but, uh, but it, it does include you know, all of them right now. That's helpful. Um, I should say, this is indirectly related to the banks, but one of our biggest concerns here is is, is financial privacy for folks, right? Um, while the database that uh, Finson would create of all this, these literally millions of bits of information that will be flowing uh, into the in, into the database. Uh, ostensibly, they're only say they will only release it to qualified law enforcement agencies. Um, but we have two big concerns about that. One is those qualified law enforcement agencies extend to um, foreign governments, law enforcement agencies, the Navy investigating uh, uh, companies for their own reasons. Um, so we're deeply concerned about what some of the motivations of some of those those foreign governments might be uh, and whether they are legitimate law enforcement or if they're fishing for some other reason. I mean, obviously there are lots of, just as an example, defense contractors and subcontractors who are small companies who will be caught up in this. And there will be all kinds of reasons that some of those foreign governments might want access to personal information about those folks. Um, but we're also concerned about old fashioned uh, leaks or, or, uh, or uh, hacks. I mean, it's not, unusual virtually every large federal database even those uh you know personnel databases that the federal government has tried to maintain uh have been exposed to bad actors and there's no reason to think this won't be uh so uh there's every reason for small companies to be deeply concerned about their privacy uh and exposure of who their investors are their driver's license numbers of their investors um and there's all kinds of reasons the companies might not want that Todd, can you can you give us some time frame um, ideas um, first, uh, if you can talk to us about the implementation date and in terms of how long you think this is potentially going to be going on for? Well, the the no one has to file anything until January of 2024. So we have basically a year until this truly becomes uh, effective and where the rubber hits the road. Uh, I I we will see some court action on this by the spring. Uh, but if depending on how that goes and whether there are ongoing appeals, it can easily go into 2023, uh, excuse me, 2024. Um, so I, that's one of the reasons that, that that injunction is one of the things we're going to push for so that, that that implementation date is essentially pushed back until the court case is settled. Uh, we won't know for a few months whether that's really going to happen or not, I think. But I think there's a decent chance of that. And we'll obviously keep you all um, informed on that. Great, thanks, Todd. Um, just a reminder, if everybody can mute your phones, um, everybody should have already been muted when you came in, but just be sure to keep that on mute or I'm get, getting some some strange sounds. Um, are there any other questions? Again, if you wanna click on the um, either the reactions or if you click on the more button, then the reaction should pop up or you can put your uh, chat into the question mm -hmm. if we have anything. Um, well, Cheryl, have... it looks like Cheryl's got another question. Sure. Hello, thanks again for the opportunity. So I guess my concern is, um, especially being, you know, I serve the underserved communities, underrepresented mm -hmm. communities. My concern is having, you know, to renew the American people's trust 
you know, I'm a little concerned with that. So because we've had so much issue with the money laundering and then, you know, here this, you know, this coming up with the CTA, I mean, I'm just, I, me personally, um, because I have a master's in organizational development and leadership, I've been looking at discourse renewal theory. And when I was at the um, leadership summit um, back in September, you guys, I did mention this. Now, discourse renewal theory, now this is how I presented it and put it together. It's like, you can actually use the same concept, you know, a renewal, you know, focusing on the future. And I mentioned sustainability and things like that. So I'm, I'm really concerned about that. And I would love to use um, this platform, you know, to bring awareness to um, communities to where I don't want people to be afraid to have a small business. I don't want them to be afraid to start small. Every big business started small. So I don't want the fear and the dread to fall on them to the degree they're discouraged because they don't have trust in the system that will, that suggests hey, you can start a small business. You can grow to be a larger corporation if that's something that you want to do. Right. Those are all really good points. And, and uh, I, I think those are, you know, some of the arguments would make sort of more publicly and, and to, the, to the media and to members of Congress about why this is a bad idea. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd love to have you speak to that, to the right places. Um, I think, Molly, you're about to say something. Yeah, I, I um, Cheryl kind of touched on an important topic that I've seen at the, some chatter in the in the chat about. Um, and Todd, if, if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, what is a beneficial owner? Who all is going to have to file these reports? A and and B, the investment angle of it, and what a huge yeah. issue that's going to be. Well, now if we yeah, you should know that a, a beneficial owner is isn't necessarily someone who even owns close to a majority of the company. A beneficial owner can be somebody who is maybe just an officer of the company uh, and owns some very small share. Uh, it could also be uh, a relatively small owner if you determine they receive some su substantial benefit and, and control of the company. Uh, but that can be somewhat a subjective thing. And that's one of our complaints about the rule, about the law itself, and the proposed rule that came out from the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network is it is not entirely clear still what a beneficial owner is. Um, and it's a new legal definition that's going to have to, I think, be refined through the courts, unfortunately. So we aren't gonna have a crystal clear definition for some time. I mean, obviously, if you're the sole owner of the company, uh, then you are clearly a beneficial owner. You own more than half the company, you are a beneficial owner. But beyond that, uh, it becomes it becomes more um, subjective, for lack of a better word. And that, we think that's a real problem. Um, but every single entity has to report. If you have fewer than 20 employees and less than $5 million in revenue, that's millions of entities, probably upwards of 30 million individual entities that exist uh, that that match that criteria or those criteria. Um, so it's a huge undertaking. And each of those entities will have obviously at least one beneficial owner. And many of them have many beneficial owners. So the individual, the, the size of the database that the federal government is collecting here is, is staggering. Um, and, and when you think through how will they use this to catch money launderers, um, it's not at all clear. I mean, I mean, I mean they're going to, Basically, if they find something over here, they might go back and check this database to figure out if something happens to be going on to figure out another entity to look into, for instance. Um, that's what they're thinking about doing it for. So it's, it's kind of this big database for a law enforcement fishing expedition. Um, and that's not something the Constitution allows. So that's one of the reasons we filed this suit. I think, um, Isabel, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, um, a couple, two things. Um, so what can I do to help, um, you know, if you want to put me in touch with somebody that like has a task list that I could go through and see what items I can mm -hmm. contribute to, to, to help out the situation, I'm um, all for it. Um, or if you guys have like on, you know, in this discussion, you want to talk about things that where we can, mm -hmm. what we can do to help, uh, you know, um, your effort, um, you know, we can talk about that now as well. Yeah. Well, we would love for folks to sort of, we, we have, as, as we alluded to before, a pretty extensive website on this. So we would love for folks to sort of go there and sort of learn more about this. There's a lot of information there. 
uh, and think about how what it would mean for your business. Can think about the reporting you'd have to do. Think about who you, what decisions you have to make in terms of who's the beneficial owner and who's not. Uh, maybe how it would apply to your clients if you deal with other small companies. Um, and 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 get back in touch with 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 Molly or with or with Ian. Uh, if you have examples you'd like to talk about, because we are we are going to need um, advocates to talk to the media about practical ways this will impact their companies, uh, and, and also uh, members of Congress. I think there's a good chance that there will be some congressional hearings around this in the new year. Uh, we'll, we may need some people to come testify. Um, and so I think that kind of public advocacy is really important. Secondly, uh, and I think this is especially true with new startups and in underserved communities, there is almost a complete lack of awareness about this in the small business community. So I would really encourage everyone to engage your networks, find an opportunity to talk to your local, you know, local chambers, local business groups you may be part of, uh, just friends that have businesses, make sure they know this is happening because there's a, there's a tremendous lack of, of, uh, of awareness about this right now. Okay, and then the other question I had was, you know, when, you know, we're talking to, you know, and you're, you're, you're putting this forward and you're talking to people about it, it, do we have an alternative if their objective is to catch money launderers, you know, would it be beneficial to say, well, you know, instead of doing this, which, which doesn't accomplish, I think, what you're trying to do, but it impacts small businesses, you know, maybe that's not our job to come up with a solution, but usually if you can trade, you know, something bad for something better, then, then that's just the appeal, right? Yeah. It, 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 it's, it, you know, some of it, it's not our job to figure out all, all those various components, but we, we, we've said a couple of things when I asked that question. And one is um, having some system where there, someone is vetting some of this information is better than one where it just kind of floods into some big database without any kind of checks, anyone asking any questions or anything else. And that's what's happening already with our financial institutions. It's clearly not perfect. Um, so there can be some refinements or improvements to what we have on that side of things in terms of third party verification. But secondly, most of this information, if not all of it, is already being collected by various parts of the federal government from the IRS to um, the SEC. And if there could be some coordination amongst uh, data that already exists uh, and not having to require small companies to report it, that would make far more sense. So a combination of those two things uh, is what makes sense to us. Okay, thanks. And I, I did put in the chat my email. If you have stories and you know how this is going to impact you, please share that information with me. Um, I, you know, if you can let me know the impact, how many employees you have, um, you know, just a sentence or two about your business, that's super helpful. Um, on the website, you'll see we have a series of um, uh, member stories and impact stories. So it needs to be very short so we can keep it there. But the more people we have talking about their impact, the, the better that is for us. So right. please email those to me. And like Todd mentioned, I, I put that link to our website again. There's, mm -hmm. there's an FAQ on there, an interactive one that you can go through and read on the site. You can download a PDF of it. Um, we just posted a letter of, I think we're up to 44 different organizations who have, you know, stood up and said, we support this lawsuit, we support what NSBA is doing. So that's another thing as you're going to Rotary or to chamber meetings or any of your networks, take that letter and let them know that yeah. we're not alone. And there are a lot of other groups out there who really support what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so that just a, a quick little pitch for that. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in. Um, Todd, can you tell us the $500,000, is that net or gross? It's actually five million, uh, and okay. it's gross. Great. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The other. Uh, sorry, I know there was another one. I'm just trying to scroll through. Um, would this impact, for example, real estate holding companies that have zero employees, i.e., no payroll, um, but do have beneficial owners? Generally speaking, yes. And that is one of our one of our other complaints. Is is the federal government is going to argue that of course they can do this because they can regulate interstate commerce. <clears throat> but in fact, it, it, this has requirements on, on entities that aren't even engaged in commerce, that are simply holding assets, for usually real estate. Um, and so there's clearly no commerce even happening, never mind interstate commerce, uh, yet they're still trying to impose these regulations on it. So clearly the Constitution doesn't allow the federal government to do that. So that's another one of our uh, constitutional arguments. Um, I should say, however, 
that there are 27 exceptions to the rule, so the, which is not necessarily a good thing because companies have to figure them out. They're, they're fairly narrow exceptions, so they don't apply to the vast majority of small companies, but there are, there are companies that do not have to comply to this, even if they meet the 20 employee and under and five million under threshold. Um, primarily, interestingly, uh, and I think not coincidentally, those are financial institutions that don't have to comply. Um, but, uh, but that is, that is another, uh, complaint we have is that, is that there's enormous complexity. And even though the Fed say this will be cheap and quick for small business to comply with, but, um, but just those twin things of figuring out who's a beneficial owner and figuring out does, is it possible that one of the 27 detailed exceptions apply to me? Those two things alone will, call, will almost requires individual companies to hire a lawyer to figure out. One other question did come in about, is, is there any way beyond the courts and beyond this potentially going to the Supreme Court, is, is there anything else we can do? Is there legislation that could be offered? Is there amendments? I mean, a, any other avenues to repeal it? Yeah, well, the, 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 the only other avenue is to get an act of Congress to pass and signed by the president to, to, to repeal this. Uh, and, and given that it was passed in a, in a, on a fairly strong bipartisan vote, um, even though I'm convinced most of them didn't really understand what they were doing, uh, they nevertheless will be reluctant to uh, um, flip-flop. So that's going to be a hard lift. And, and then even if they do, at least the current administration has indicated their support for this law. So I don't think it would we'd have enough support to sustain a veto. So until the political uh, tea leaves change, I think court action is our is our most promising uh, route forward. I'm not seeing any other questions that have come through. So um, I, I do want to just mention, if you have questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, please send in those member stories. A any way we can be a resource, let me know, especially as you're going out and talking mm -hmm. to other organizations, because there is a huge lack of knowledge. So um, let us let us know how we can be helpful. Shoot me an email, shoot Ian an email. Um, and with that, Todd, I'll turn it back to you for a closing. Yeah, well, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. This is, the, I think, this is the beginning of a long road. Uh, I said we uh, expect a response from the Feds in January, so we'll keep everyone updated on the progress of this as it happens, um, and uh, we're going to continue to build support uh, for what we're doing nationally. Uh, I, I think it's really, really uh, terrific that so many organizations from across the political spectrum have already signed on and indicating their support for what we're doing. And, uh, and, we're, and we're getting pretty good uh, media coverage as well, which is also highlighted on the, on the website. So um, thank you very much. This is, this is not the end. So we'll, be, we'll, we'll stay in touch with you as this happens. Um, but we appreciate you uh, educating yourselves and staying up to speed on this. So thanks for being here and have a great weekend, everybody.